Folks, is it good to have you with me? Dr. James Hoffman here. Welcome to another segment of our Hypertrophy Training Scientific Principles video series. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're going to be talking today. So at this point, if you haven't watched some of our previous videos on the scientific principles of hypertrophy training, make sure you go back and take a look at those because I think they'll be really useful for you. Some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today already include some of those elements in there. So you might be listening to me going, what the heck is he talking about? So if you find yourself in that position, go ahead, go back through our YouTube channel and watch some of the previous installments because I think it'll help you out a whole bunch. Now, as you guys have probably learned, hypertrophy training, really, really interesting topic. Some of you might be looking at this going, who the fuck is this guy? Who is he? Is this Dr. Mike? No, I'm not Dr. Mike. I get confused with Dr. Mike all the time for some reason. I am Dr. James Hoffman. For those of you who do know me, you probably have figured out I'm here for a pretty specific purpose. And I'm usually more into the sport training side of things. So you guys have learned a lot about hypertrophy training up to this point. And I'm going to help you guys learn how to incorporate some of those elements into a good sport training program. I mean, how many things have we learned about to this point? You guys have talked about all the principles, right, with Dr. Mike. We've introduced new things like SFR, which is really important. We've looked at things like set progression algorithms and things like that. Also really important. We've looked at the volume landmarks, things that we have talked about for a long time. All sorts of cool little nuanced ideas for hypertrophy training. So now we're going to take a look at those things and say, okay, well, I know how to do hypertrophy training, at least theoretically. I got a pretty good idea of how that works. How do I incorporate that into some of the other activities that I do? Maybe I play sports. Maybe I do some other recreational hobbies or things that I enjoy. How do those things kind of melt together? Et voila, that's why I'm here. So why don't we go ahead and get into it? I'm going to do a screen share. Hopefully it's not too wonky. Uh, yeah, I don't know why it shrunk that thing down, but whatever. We'll just roll with it. We'll get it going here. There we go. Looking much better. All right, folks. So the title of my talk today is Hypertrophy Training for Other Sports and Activities. And again, this will be a topic that is covered in our upcoming book that covers all the scientific principles of hypertrophy training. And this is just a segment of that book. And we hope you enjoy it. So what are we going to be talking about today? The big things we're going to be looking at are the differences between training for physique and training for sport. Now, most of you are probably thinking like, duh, I kind of get that. But there are some really distinct differences that are noteworthy and why we might make some programming or kind of contextual changes for those things. And I'm going to try and highlight the ones that I think are really important. And then last, I'm going to give you some just kind of bullet points and some important take homes about how you incorporate hypertrophy training into sports and other activities. And this, again, is something that we cover way more in our upcoming book. But for now, why don't we get into it and have a little chat. So as most of you probably know, hypertrophy training, pretty sweet, right? Growing more muscle, getting bigger. When last time I did a video with Chad, I did this like a hundred times and Chad still hasn't stopped making fun of me for it. So I'm resisting the urge to do a, a front double bicep while I'm talking, but it might come up. Just don't judge, right? It's going to pop up every now and again. Let it go. So we know that growing muscle not only is cool for vanity, but if you haven't figured it out by yet, it also can have a pretty significant role in increasing strength and power output for sports. And we can see, right, dude, I love this video. It's so good, right? That's quite a stiff arm. Get the fuck out of here. Sit down. So we know that athletes who are really muscular sometimes have a pretty good one-up in the strength and power department than athletes who are less muscular, right? So we know that there are substantial benefits to growing muscle mass for all of sports. And that's just not for things like football and strength and power sports. We know that, believe it or not, you need some muscle to be good at endurance sports as well. You just need less of it, but you still need some good, solid, endurance muscle in there. So we know that growing muscle in whatever capacity is good for sporting outcomes as well as for vanity and for funsies, right? So the question really is, can we take all that same cool things that we learned so far about hypertrophy training and directly just carry them over into trying to do hypertrophy training for other sports? That's the big question. So the problem that we run into is that the answer is kind of nuanced. It is yes to some degree, but not exactly in many others. So we always have to go back to what I think is the most important training principle, and I think most of you would agree, is specificity. Specificity is kind of our first initial funnel when we're looking at training, right? So that we can just immediately eliminate things that are totally garbage and unrelated to what we're doing. So if we're looking at specificity of training for physique training, 
This generally means we're trying to be as lean and muscular as possible. Now, there's certainly varying degrees of that. If you're just doing physique for fun, like you're just doing it because you want to be fit and healthy, and maybe you don't want to be a bodybuilder, that's perfectly fine. You're trying to find that sweet spot of how much fuss and effort you're putting into it and how much uh, body composition improvement you get out of it. Other people maybe are trying to be more like physique athletes, bodybuilders, for example, and they're trying to achieve peak levels of leanness and muscularity. Most of us are maybe somewhere in the middle where we're not really competing, but we're taking it more seriously than just training for health, you know, et cetera. So for the most part, though, in a very vague kind of just superficial sense, the specificity constraint that we see for physique training generally is just trying to increase muscle mass and decrease fat mass over time. Sport training, on the other hand, is much more constrained because we have very, very specific sporting outcomes that we're trying to achieve. So the overarching goal is to, of course, get better at whatever sport or fun activities that we're doing. But then we break that down into little subcomponents of areas like fitness, skills, and tactics. And we say, okay, which of these things make me most successful at sport or increase my probability of success at sport? And how can I improve those things, right? And so that's kind of where our specificity funnel goes. It really doesn't kind of meld well with the idea of always just trying to be as big and lean as possible. Sometimes that works, but in many cases it doesn't. So we have an immediate kind of constriction on specificity right there. One thing we do know about training for physique and hypertrophy training is that it's very forgiving, meaning you can do all sorts of silly, wacky shit and still get great results. Take a look at modern bodybuilders. Have you ever watched videos from the 90s? I grew up during that time, so I've watched nothing but Ronnie Coleman, Branch Warren training videos, and goddamn do they do some silly, dumb things. But guess what? They were successful in spite of that. And what we have kind of found out later in the more modern time, not that like the 90s was that long ago, but more currently, right? We found out that, you know what? You can get a really good hypertrophic response just from hitting some pretty minimum criteria, right? So one of the things that we look at is volumes, like are you doing enough training volume? We know that there's a huge spectrum of intensities that you can work within and uh, from an absolute sense, right? So like anywhere between five and 30 reps is generally pretty good. We also know that from a relative intensity sense, right? Anywhere between like zero to four RIR works pretty good. Um, for getting more muscle. And we also know that frequency is kind of negotiable for some things. We know that exercise order is very negotiable in some things. And your SFR choices, these are all very highly individualized things. There's not one particular movement per muscle group that is better than all. What we find is that you can pick and choose the ones that tend to work really well for you. And even if you don't have the best program, you can get a pretty good result. Now, obviously you want the best program that you can, and that's why you're watching these videos. But we know that hypertrophy training, for the most part, is very forgiving. So you can do a lot of things, maybe not the best, and still get a great result. However, sport training is not as forgiving, right? Because we're directly trying to stimulate what we call transfer of training effects. Meaning, you're doing some training that will eventually have a positive effect on the outcomes that you want in your sport. Meaning, you can run faster, jump higher, throw the ball further, right? Make more tackles. Uh, break more tackles, things along those lines, right? So the idea being you're doing some type of training and that training has a direct positive impact on what we would call the key performance indices of your sport. And because of that, it's much more constrained in terms of the things that we mentioned in that previous bullet point, volume, intensity, frequency, exercise order, SFR. We have to really start narrowing these things down so that we can actually stimulate direct transfer of training effects. So that funnel is much more constrained for sport training than it is for hypertrophy training. And that's another problem that we run into, all again, tying back to the idea of specificity. So <laughs> if you guys know me, I love me a good synthol guy. My favorite was Indian synthol. We call him Indian synthol guy, um, but that's because we're all ignorant. He's actually Brazilian synthol guy, um, but this is just another guy. He's clearly about to step into an MMA fight. I wonder how it's gonna go. There's definitely a video, you should check it out. Anyways, so when we look at training for physique, and training for sport. There's a number of different points at which we start to diverge or our funnels kind of go in slightly different directions. And there are many of them, but there's four big ones that I want to talk to you guys about today. And those are, first off, body composition. So without a doubt, body composition might be the most important difference that we see. It's, it's hard to say one is better than the other, but it's one of the most um, 
has the biggest practical implications and how we address things differently. So again, if you're a physique person, within the constraints of your lifestyle boundaries and trade-offs that you're willing to make, you're trying to be as lean, as muscular as those things will allow, right? That is not necessarily the goal for sporting athletes, right? In sports, we have to deal with things like optimal uh, competition body weights and body compositions. Sometimes that means increasing body mass through, you know, increasing your lean body mass and hypertrophy training. Sometimes it means decreasing fat. Sometimes it might mean decreasing a little bit of both or increasing a little bit of both. So it's not always as clear cut as just get as jacked and lean as possible. Everybody's going to have an ideal competition body weight and body composition. And that's what having a good coach and a good monitoring program can help all athletes do. So that's a big difference right off the bat. We're also going to see differences in managing levels of preparedness. What is preparedness for hypertrophy training? Well, really all you have to do is have enough preparedness to go in there and get an overloading session. And if you don't know what that means, go back and watch the overload video. Come on, you're too far in, right? But you need to be able to Every time you come in and do a training session, assuming it's meant to be a training session and not a recovery session, you need to present an overload for hypertrophy. How do you do that? Well, you really just need to be able to hit anywhere between five and 30 reps for the most part, anywhere between zero to four RIR and present enough volume to generate a progressive overload over time. It doesn't mean necessarily the next session has to be way more than the other one. It could just be like a one rep difference, something like that, but you need to be able to present an overload, which for the most part is pretty freaking easy. Managing preparedness for hypertrophy training really is just not driving yourself into the ground by having poor fatigue management. So what we know is that hypertrophy training, MRV preparedness is way up there, right? So you can do a lot of training before you start hitting your preparedness MRV. And when we say preparedness MRV, what I'm saying is you are no longer able to present an overload for that stimulus, for a hyper hypertrophic stimulus, right? So hypertrophy training, for the most part, as long as you're not a knucklehead, pretty easy to manage preparedness. What else are you managing in hypertrophy training? Oh, that's it. Just that. That's all you got to do. It's easy, right? What about sports? Well, sports is a little bit different because you have multiple levels of fitness and skills and tactics that need to be trained, all of which are very, very sensitive to the effects of fatigue. Now, if you're doing hypertrophy training for sport, you kind of are in that same boat where it's like, okay, I can do quite a bit of training. But what we also know is hypertrophy training generates a lot of fatigue and a lot of other areas of fitness, skills, and tactical development are very sensitive to the effects of fatigue. And so what we find is that if you're doing hypertrophy training, you will often exceed your MRV for other areas of fitness, such as things like speed and power, or other areas of skills and tactics. Like you might not be able to learn new techniques well or at all, or refine existing techniques. You might not be able to consolidate some of the learning that you've done into generating good strategies for your sport. This is real. And fatigue is going to directly interfere with those things. So in sport training, we're managing fitness skills and tactics. In physique training, we're only managing fitness for hypertrophy, which again is very easy, whereas the other things for sports tend to be a little bit more finicky and we have to be a little bit more mindful of it. The next one is force and velocity characteristics. And this uh, directly ties to the intensity at which we train. So again, bodybuilding training or hypertrophy training it's very forgiving. You can train at high intensities, high absolute intensities, meaning like a lot of weight on the bar. You can train at pretty low absolute intensities, meaning not that much weight and still get a lot of hypertrophy. Um, unfortunately, those transfer of training effects don't always manifest for things like maximum strength and power unless you're training kind of close to that. So what I mean by that is if you're doing something like 10 to 20 reps, what is the potential transfer of training effect to doing like a 20 meter sprint as a lacrosse player or a soccer player? It's actually very, very much outside of the uh, force, velocity, and power characteristics of many, many sports. So what we have to do is make sure that when we're doing hypertrophy training, we're not deviating too far outside of what is going to be an effective transfer of training effect, meaning the weights can't be too light, or if they are light, we have to be moving explosively in order to get that transfer of training effect. And unfortunately, the problem that you run into is you say, okay, well, if you're doing reps of 10 to 20, you could be generating a really, really high power output on some of those reps. That's true for about four or five reps. And then after that, it just becomes junk volume. Ah, so that's the problem that we run into, right? Same thing goes with the higher rep ranges, like 20 to 30, something like that. That is gonna have very little transfer of training effects to most sporting activities, even endurance training to some degree, because the more if you wanna have more endurance in the muscle, your best option is actually just to do that endurance training and not try and get it through resistance training. So 
we want to make sure that the training that we're doing is going to align with the intensities that our sport is done at, right? And sometimes in hypertrophy training, it doesn't always melt, right? And then last, it's not really unique to hypertrophy training. It's uh, something that we deal with with all training, and that's just opportunity cost, meaning Whatever you train, you have to weigh the pros and cons of doing something else, right? There's always something else that you could be doing. So you want to make sure that with the time and resources that you have, you are making the best choices, right? Time, training resources are limited. You don't get to just have infinity. So the, one, the things that you do, right, come at the cost of other things. And that, those other things could even just be something simple like time spent recovering. So we want to make sure that if we're doing hypertrophy training, it is serving a very distinct purpose because there's going to be pros and cons of doing hypertrophy training and the pros certainly must outweigh the cons because if the cons outweigh the pros, then it's like, why are you doing this in the first place? So we want to make sure that we're looking at the pros and cons and weighing those opportunity costs, just like we would with any other training, right? Okay. So let's talk about a few of those bullet points in a little bit more detail, right? So as we already mentioned, if you're doing physique training and hypertrophy training, you're generally trying to be as lean and muscular as your lifestyle will allow for, whatever compromises that you are willing to make. If you're like your boy here, I like to throw a few back a couple times a week, maybe three if I'm feeling froggy. Uh, and that's probably going to have a negative effect on my body composition, but it's something that I like to do for my lifestyle because I enjoy it, right? And that's a trade-off that you recognize. So those trade-offs that you make are up to you. Some people are willing to make more and be more competitive. Some are willing to make less. No judgment. That's totally fine. And maybe you won't be as jacked. No worries, right? But you're trying to find that sweet spot in your body composition goals and your lifestyle. Sport training, we're really not fussing with that too much at all. Really what we're looking at is we have normative standards of body weight and body composition. And what that means is you can look at your sport or maybe your position within a sport. You can look at people who are competitive in that sport, whatever level that you're at. Maybe it's just uh, high school, college, world championship, nationals, Olympics, whatever. You can actually find this kind of stuff out just through a little bit of research. You can say, how much do the people on average do, that are doing what I'm doing weigh? And what is their general fat mass and muscle mass at that weight? These are things that you will find through research, right? And generally what we want to find is getting our athlete closer and closer and closer to those normative standards within some individual boundaries, right? So maybe some people actually do better when they're a little heavier or a little lighter or somewhere in between. But what we know for the most part is you can take an activity like doing hurdles, for example, and you will find that people who are at the top of their game in hurdling generally have kind of a similar body weight and body composition situation, meaning they're usually weigh this roughly the same amounts and generally have the same body fats and muscle mass amounts, right? And these are things you can figure out. So when we're looking at sport training, we're not trying to be as lean and muscular as possible. We're trying to say, where is my optimal body, excuse me, where is my optimal competition body weight and body composition? And we can use normative standards to kind of help narrow that down and then individualize for our athlete. We also know that kind of within this idea of an ideal competition body weight and body composition, we're dealing with this idea of strength and power to body weight ratios, which for me is one of the most important aspects of an integrated periodization plan, meaning I'm managing my athletes training, I'm managing their diet, maybe their recovery, maybe their psychology. One of the things that is my duty is to make sure that they have found where they compete at the best, meaning they have gone lighter, they've gone heavier, they've gone more muscular, more fat, less muscular, less fat, and they have found, you know, my best performances are at this weight and this amount of muscle mass. And I have figured that out through trial and error over time. And that is a huge part of sport. So not surprisingly, a lot of success in sport involves how well you can propel your body in the environment or move within the environment against opposition, right? And how strong you are and how much body weight you have. <clears throat> Excuse me, that, was, that one was okay. I'm trying to do a better one later. I don't got it in me right now. So strength and power to body weight ratios are a really, really clear cut thing. But unfortunately, people don't think about them. And there's really only a few examples that I can think of off the top of my head where it's not, um, not as clear. <laughs> and I think you'll see where I'm going with this with these examples. Sumo wrestling, right? Strongman, American football. In these cases, it actually sometimes is just in your benefit to be as large as possible, meaning having a lot of muscle mass is great, but sometimes just having a lot of ballast, meaning just being a big person, um, can also be really beneficial. Most sports are not like that. Most sports say, hey, you're probably going to have your you know, best performances at you know, this per percent body fat, at this body weight. 
there's just a handful where it's like, okay, it's probably good to be as big as possible. And there's just a few. And then there's a couple on the other direction where you could say something like um, gymnastics kind of favors the lower end of that spectrum. Not to say that uh, it's good to be as small as possible for gymnastics, but it's definitely one of those where you really are going to favor having a lighter body weight just because you're literally flinging yourself all around on these different implements through space, right? So we see a few exceptions to this, but most sporting activities, you can absolutely find normative standard and then individualized standards for body weight and body composition. The goal is not necessarily to be as big and lean as possible. And in fact, there's probably a big cost in many sports to being too lean or too fat. So we got to figure that out. So when you're trying to train for physique, one of the things that we find is that you're actually trying to gain muscle all around. And it doesn't really matter what muscle fibers you're trying to hypertrophy because you're trying to get as big as possible. You're trying to get all those muscle fibers, homie. Look at Ronnie. Gee, Louise, he's a big boy. So what we find is that um, because you can hypertrophy under a variety of different intensity zones, you can actually kind of preferentially target different muscle fiber types within any given region of your body. So that means we're actually gonna be trying to make things like our type two X, the big explosive muscle fibers bigger, the intermediate ones and the more slow twitch ones, all bigger over time. That's great. What about for sport? Now this is where it gets kind of weird and funky. So developing an optimal competition body weight and then of course tied into that is strength and power to body weight ratios we actually have to selectively target which muscle fiber types that we want because we want our weight to be filled up with the muscle fiber types that are going to have the largest impact and most success in the sport that we're doing. So for strength and power sports, we're gonna be trying to bias towards those type two X muscle fibers, right? In uh, some other sports, you can make a case for the intermediate fibers, but that's something that you actually just train in your sport training. For the most part, you'll still be biasing towards type two to try and become as powerful and as strong as you reasonably can. And then in endurance sports, we're actually trying to preferentially bias towards those type one fibers a little bit, right? So what we want in developing an optimal body composition and power and strength to body weight ratio is to actually accumulate the right type of muscle mass that's going to propel us in our sporting endeavors. So just to kind of put it in context, right? You might find that you hypertrophy really, really, you're very responsive to hypertrophy, right? But you also find that when you get too big, maybe you're in a weight class sport, or maybe you're, you're just, you can exceed kind of some of those normative standards uh, for body composition that you just don't play as well because you're too heavy. It costs you a lot of energy. You start to slow down a lot, right? This is a real thing. So ideally, and this is maybe more true for weight class sports, but it's true for all sports. You want the content of your muscles and that weight that you carry around to have the largest impact on your sport as possible. And you don't want to be carrying around a lot of other muscle that's not going to be contributing as much as possible. So most sporting activities, I would say roughly, you know, 90%, maybe even more, are what we would classify as strength power sports, meaning that most of the action or most of the KPIs revolve around you being strong, explosive, or fast, right? It doesn't mean that there aren't other activities in uh, the sport. It just means that the action occurs in those kind of scenarios. And then the other kind of maybe 10% or so is our endurance sports, right? Which is really more of our sustained output type sports. So in that case, we're going to be looking at more at our kind of developing our slow twitch muscle fibers. And in the other case, uh, cases of strength and power sports, we're going to be looking at developing our faster twitch muscle fibers. So if you are a strength and power sport athlete, you don't want to load up on a ton of slow twitch muscle because it's just not going to be doing what you want it to do. And now you're carrying around extra weight. That's not helping. And it's decreasing your strength and power to body weight ratio. Voila. Okay. So that's that one. We've talked a lot about body composition. We also mentioned before that the preparedness for hypertrophy training is pretty robust meaning you can, you don't need to manage a whole lot as long as you're not crippled with fatigue, right? We already kind of alluded to this idea that the preparedness you need for other sports is less robust, meaning you have other things that you're training for. When you're trying to learn, refine, or integrate skills, you need to be very sharp and you need to be kind of in that flow state, right? And fatigue will directly inhibit your physical and psychological abilities to do those things. So they are very, very sensitive. This is true for all skills all tactics, and then many areas of fitness. So what we find is that um, other areas of fitness, right, things like you can kind of go uh, from like a, a hierarchical perspective, right? You have endurance training, which is probably the most robust, hypertrophy training, kind of moving down in order. Uh, then you have kind of like your strength 
power, speed. And that's what we would see in terms of fitness. They kind of have a descending order in that regard in terms of how much fatigue you can tolerate how, and with the level of preparedness that you have to manage. Um, similarly, we see skills and tactics very, very much way lower than hypertrophy training, much, much, much less, and probably more similar to what you would see in kind of like power and speed development if we were to make a comparison to fitness training, which is, it's hard to do that, but you get the kind of idea. It's way down there. You have to have a high level of preparedness, meaning a low fatigue state in order to train those things, which sucks. So when we find that preparedness drops too low, right? And this is true for fitness skills and tactics. These things can be overloaded just like fitness can. You can't produce an overloading stimulus, meaning you can't get better. And then attempting to get better at those things when you can't actually produce an overload is junk volume. You guessed it, right? So we run into this problem where you're too fatigued to actually train the things that you want to train. You're trying to do so, but you're not getting anything out of it. So you're just producing even more fatigue than you were before and not getting better at the things that you want. Fuck, that sucks, right? That's a big old shit smoothie that you're drinking. So we have to manage these different levels of preparedness, which is very, very difficult. And, and this is not always a clear cut like, oh, just dial back this dial back this and you're good. This is something that you have to manage as an athlete and with coaches and sports scientists to help you out along the way because it's complicated, right? So the fatigue that you get from doing hypertrophy training will absolutely cap you off on what you can do in your other areas of fitness skills and tactics. This is not up for debate. It's just something, it's the same thing as training for fitness in any other capacity, right? If you're too fatigued, it won't work. Well, if you're training for skills and tactics, if you're too fatigued, it also won't work, right? More so than fitness in many cases, because they're inherently tied to learning. So what we find is that hypertrophy training, because of the high volumes of training, and this is, this is kind of the problem that you run into, is in order to get a good overloading stimulus for hypertrophy, generally you need to train at high volumes, right? The intensity is negotiable, but we'll get more into that later. But for the most part, you need to train a rate, a pretty large volume of training. The volume is going to have a, a parallel, direct kind of linear relationship with your fatigue state. So the more stuff you do, the more your fatigue goes up. Well, as that fatigue goes up, you start exceeding your preparedness amounts for all these different things, right? And that's the problem that you run into. So hypertrophy training is very fatiguing and that fatigue will prevent you from training these other things. So we have to strategically plan hypertrophy training periods if we're going to do it for our athletes during times that will have a minimal impact on their other KPIs, right? Meaning if you have to focus on your other skills and tactics as urgent, uh, urgent things that need to be done, Hypertrophy training is not what you want to be doing right then and there. You might want to put that off to another time, like maybe uh, like in your off season or more general prepare uh, GPP type training so that it's not going to squash the training that's maybe more important to you right now, which is actually getting good at your sport. So we have to implement those things strategically. And usually what we recommend and what I've recommended for a long time is any type of body composition alteration, whether you're trying to maintain muscle while you lose fat or increase muscle mass, uh, and gain fat at the same time should be done during those GPP periods, which is well, well, well away from any competition periods and before any specific preparatory periods. So you'll do that stuff early on in the training, maybe for you know a couple mesos, and then you'll move into your specific preparatory training and no more body composition changes occur from that point on until you move on to the next cycle. So one of the things that we also mentioned within this idea of body composition, strength of power, body weight ratios is this idea of having the same muscle type characteristics uh, preferentially trained as you are going to be competing with, right? And so we know that hypertrophy training is very forgiving. You can use a wide range of loading schemes to get a hypertrophy stimulus, and that's great. Unfortunately, the KPIs for sport will generally revolve around high force, high power, or high velocity type activities. And this is just an example of a force velocity curve with a little power curve drawn in there, right? So we are gonna be biased, have to bias some of our training to those higher intensity type trainings. And when we say higher intensity, that might mean using a lot of weight, right? And, and really trying to maximize the amount of weight on the bar and the forces that produce, or trying to maximize movement speed or power output, right? Um, what we don't want to see is training at like a mid to range, mid range to low range uh, intensity loading zone and not actually moving at high velocities or high power outputs. That unfortunately is effectively a waste of time and junk volume for most of our athletes who are strength power athletes. So in that regard, this is another area where we tend to be constricted. We have to funnel down our specificity of training to favor either the high force 
high velocity or high power output style training. Now, again, you might think like, well, if you do something that's 20 to 30 reps, can't you just do it fast? It's like, yeah, you can do it fast for a few reps, but then the rest of them are all just junk, right? And then that junk is going to prevent you from being fast in subsequent sets. That's the problem that you run into. So typically for sport training, we're going to be biasing for most sports towards those type two characteristics, which can be trained through, again, high force or high power type activities. And even for our endurance training folks, we're going to be biasing a lot of the strength training eventually towards that. So we're going to spend some time working on work capacity and stuff like that, but it still benefits most of our endurance athletes to train for strength to some degree, at the very least to maintain your muscle mass and reduce your training volumes or to prevent injuries. Or if you're doing something like triathlon, you might actually have to be going up and down hills and strength can be really, really useful for hills and things like that. So we're going to be biasing for the most part towards our type two characteristics. Now, what we find is that when you do hypertrophy training, it's generally not done in a such a way that is meant to maximize strength or power output outcomes, right? Which is again, one, some of the biggest KPIs for most sports. So we're generally gonna see our biasing, our hypertrophy. So we have to kind of split the difference, right? So you've gotta be strong and powerful, but if you just train for like threes, that's probably not the best way to get hypertrophy, right? So what we find is we're gonna actually bias towards that lowest end of our effective hypertrophy rep range, which is that five to 10 rep range. And this is something that actually has been shown to have phase potentiated transfer of training effects. Meaning if you train for sets of five to 10, that is heavy enough to have downstream uh, strength improvements when you start training for strength, right? You will gain muscle and you will gain muscle in such a way that is good for uh, developing strength and or power. So this is something that's been shown for a long time, even with some mathematical modeling. So that rep range tends to be the most biased in our hypertrophy training towards those type two characteristics. And so that's where we're going to spend most of our time. You can include some of those uh, 10 to 20 rep ranges, but my strong recommendation would generally not to not do that unless you're having specific light sessions probably don't ever want to be going above 15 reps for the most part just because they're going to have very very little carryover that's not to say that some movements might not respond better in that range for example like arms and delts or you don't want to be doing sets of five it's just silly if you've ever done it before you know exactly what i'm talking about it's just not a good payout so you might bias some movements in some instances into that higher rep range but your main movements probably are going to be spent in that five to ten rep range, right? Training at higher reps and uh, higher, uh, lower loading zones tends to shift the motor units towards being in that slow twitch or more fatigue resistant type state rather than being in more of that fast twitch, forceful, explosive state, which is what we want. So we don't want to be shifting our fiber characteristics over to more slow twitch, more fatigue resistant, and whatever we need for sport, we'll get that through our sport training. Like if you're a rugby player or a soccer player, you need to be, you need to have some endurance, but guess what? You get that through your conditioning and your, your sport practice. You don't have to do that in the weight room. The weight room is going to be meant for you getting stronger. And then our last big bullet point, you know, we said before, all training is subject to opportunity costs, meaning you could be doing something else. You want to make sure that your time is being well spent. We know that hypertrophy training requires a lot of volume and thus a lot of fatigue gets generated. And it also requires a lot of time. Like you might end up spending a couple hours in the gym rather than just like 45 minutes doing your normal strength kind of workout, right? So we know that it does come at a very large cost. You're going to generate a lot of fatigue. You're going to be spending a lot of time doing it. And that might prevent you from training other areas of your KPI. So any coach and athlete who is deciding to do hypertrophy training for the purposes of their sport, you have to weigh the pros and cons and say, okay, you might actually compete better at one or two weight classes up. The way that you will be better is if you have more muscle and then more strength and then more power, right? But to get there, it might take months, years of, you know, phase potentiated hypertrophy training, which will take you away from doing the other parts of your sport. Can we do that? Or would that be too great of a cost, right? And there's no clear cut answer. And that's why you have to have a really good needs analysis. If you've ever followed any of my stuff, you've probably heard me talk about needs analysis before. I actually have a whole video on it. But this is key, right? You have to weigh the pros and cons and say, what is going to have the largest impact in the short and long term? Does my, does my athlete need to lose fat? Yes or no? Do they need to gain muscle? Yes or no? Or do they just suck at basketball? Do they just, are they just shitty, right? Is the, is the bigger concern developing the skills and tactics, right? That, those are real questions. It's very difficult to answer. And that's why a formal needs analysis can help funnel that down a little bit. 
All right, so now if we're gonna incorporate some of these ideas into a good hypertrophy training program, what do we need to know? Well, the good news is I made a lot of cases why it's different, but at the end of the day, a lot of it's the same, right? Most of the same rules apply, which makes our life a little bit easier. So some of the more fundamental things, like are we gonna be training our muscles from MEV to MRV? Yes. Now, I would make an argument that if you have someone and they are doing another sport or activity, you might train from MEV to MAV because MAV is still a really, really robust stimulus. And the difference between getting from MAV to MRV might be a whole shitload of fatigue with very, very small differences in payout, right? So you don't have to train at MEV. You can go with the same thing, MEV to MRV. But consider any muscle group you take to an MRV is going to lose a substantial amount of preparedness, which may prevent you from doing other things. Whereas just training to MAV may allow you to hang in there just enough to keep going with a lot of your sports stuff, or at the very least, not have to restrict yourself too much from fatigue. So my suggestion would be MAV could be a very good alternative in this case, right? We still want you to make good SFR choices to minimize systemic fatigue. Now, the problem that we run into here is that in physique training, a lot of really high SFR choices might be kind of like our more isolation type exercises. And that's okay in this context. However, we would want to bias our choices to those which are going to have really good transfer of training effects. And which movements are those? Well, sorry to tell you, they're generally going to be our compound barbell type movements, right? So you're, you're pressing movements, you're squatting movements, you're pulling movements, you're weightlifting derivatives, et cetera, right? So in this case, you still want good SFR choices, right? So even in this case, like doing a low bar squat, it's probably a poor SFR choice just because the fatigue you get from it is so awful, right? Whereas you might be able to do something like a high bar squat, that's gonna have a ton of carryover. The SFR is gonna be pretty good on average for most people and you might include some other isolation or leg press kind of movements later on if you still have some volume to fill. What we don't wanna see is you preferentially biasing towards like isolation movements. A good example of this might be like, um, you might have uh, for physique training, you might be very responsive in your packs to doing like a cable fly and you might be like, damn, I get a lot out of these cable flies. And that's great, no, no judgment. Um, but for something like football or rugby or any some like our contact sports where you have to extend your arms out, maybe push or pull people or block people, what's gonna have a better transfer of training effect? Those cable flies or the bench press? Uh, the bench press more often than not. And so we have to kind of strike a balance here where we still want good high SFR choices, like movements that get you really strong and have high transfer of training effects. And more often than not, that will mean kind of whittling down some of our isolation movements out, not completely, but just biasing more towards those heavy barbell compound movements more often than not. Now, again, they also tend to be more fatiguing. So you might have to balance those out a little bit, but again, that's the price you pay for the transfer of training effects. You really want those compound movements in there as much as you can reasonably. And then Things like volume and intensity progressions will follow the same general patterns. Again, moving from MEV to either MAV or MRV, we already talked about that. Increasing the weight on the bar to stay in your loading zones and uh, you know uh, absolute, or excuse me, relative intensities, and then having some kind of progression in relative intensity as well, whether it's effort or RIR or however you wanna do it, all those things still apply here. There are some differences that are noteworthy. We know that your local muscle and your systemic MRVs will be much lower than that of if you were just doing hypertrophy training alone. Meaning if you were doing some sport training and hypertrophy training, take your hypertrophy numbers and squish them down a little bit. How much depends on how much other sport training that you are doing, but just don't use the same numbers that you're doing before because you have added a whole nother training element. Maybe you have practice a couple times per week. Maybe you're doing some other specific training. So just take your normal stuff, your systemics and your locals and drive them down a little bit because you have added another training stimulus that you have to account for. No big deal. If you've, if you've read, uh, how much should I train? You'd be like, yeah, duh, got it, right? We also know that cardiovascular training and most sports have some cardiovascular component and most kind of recreational activities have some cardiovascular component as well. Um, will have a bigger impact on your systemic MRV. So basically, if you have some kind of structured cardio training that you're doing, assume your systemic MRV goes down a little bit compared to hypertrophy training alone. And that's not to say it's bad. It's just how it is, right? So if you have some kind of structured cardio component, that's going to be very impactful on your systemic MRV and possibly your local too, if you're you know running or whatever modality you're using, uh, it's going to have an effect on the local muscles. But for sure, your systemic is going to be much lower.
And then again, we've already kind of beat this one to death. Your intensity will generally be biased in that five to 10 rep range to ensure that you're gonna have good transfer of training effects to your sport, uh, especially in the areas of strength and power. A couple other changes that are maybe useful for you. You're gonna probably reduce your training frequency per muscle group uh, by about a half a session to one session per week less than you would normally do for hypertrophy training. Meaning if you trained biceps four times a week when you're not doing sports, when you are doing sports and hypertrophy, you might do it three times a week, something like that. We say a half because sometimes you have kind of like a light session where it's not, you know, super directly stimulated, but it is stimulated to some degree. So, you know, whether it was, it could, sometimes you have recovery sessions, et cetera, right? So anywhere between a half session to one session less per week is a good starting point. And then again, adjusting from there. We're also gonna encourage our athletes to move with maximal intent, meaning whenever they're doing a repetition, they're gonna try and move the bar as forcefully and fast as they can. Now, if you're doing sets of five, how fast can you really move? Not that fast, right? But your intent is to move really fast. This is something that's easy to say, but also easy to forget. So one thing that we like to remind our athletes who are doing hypertrophy training, say, when you move that bar, you're doing eight reps, but you're gonna move really hard, really forcefully, every single time you do a rep, even up to eight reps. Now it's gonna slow down, right? Certainly, but we wanna be moving with that maximal intent and kind of shifting that force velocity curve as much to the right as we can, right? Uh, we also know that we, sometimes it's easier to consolidate some of our muscle groups. Like if you're doing physique training, you might be breaking down every single muscle group into MEVs, MAVs, et cetera, right? For sport training, sometimes that's just unnecessarily complicated, and you might just consolidate down into things like push, pull, you know, like legs or anterior chain, posterior chain legs, something like that, just because it's easier than saying like, okay, well, I did a clean pull, and that's kind of quads, but it's kind of glutes, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of hamstrings at least at one point, like, you know what I mean? So uh, sometimes it's just easier to say, okay, Today we're getting our 10 sets or, you know, this week we're getting 10 sets of push, upper body push. And that will be a combination of maybe some different pressing movements. And that's perfectly fine. It's okay to do it that way. There's, you can certainly be more complicated, but oftentimes it's unnecessarily complicated. So as a coach, as an athlete, only you can figure out where that balance is. Usually I would say consolidate those things down a little bit, make your life a little bit easier. You're not really going to be losing out on much if you don't count it as chest and you only count it as push and vice versa, right? And then a couple other things that's worth no noting. If you have some cardiovascular component, you're gonna be dealing with concurrent training issues. Sometimes it's good to keep those things separate. You can actually make a good case that sometimes it's good to have those things maybe in the same day. And that's something that our friend and colleague, Chad Wesley Smith, calls the consolidation of stressors. And I love that phrasing. I think it's really, really good. And basically what that says is like, hey, if you have to run several times a week and you have to train legs, several times a week, most people will think, okay, run or, you know, lift this day, run this day, lift this day, run this day. And the next thing you know, you're essentially training legs virtually every day of the week and you have no recovery sessions. It is good to have some space on some days, especially for those where you have to have like a high level of preparedness, meaning like if you're squatting heavy or you're doing like high intensity interval training, you got to be, you have to hit an intensity threshold in order for it to be stimulative. And so some space is good in those cases. In other cases where you're, you're not, you know, as limited by intensity, like if you have a longer run or lower, lower intensities, you can actually pair some of these things up. Like you might do a lifting with the legs in the morning and then a cardio in the evening and actually have both of those done in the same day. And you might be like, why on earth would you do that? Well, you'd only do it for exercises and activities where the intensity is not as limiting. And what you gain by doing so is actually recovery days for that muscle group throughout the week, which is really good, right? So instead of you know, indirectly training legs four to five times a week because you split up your cardio and your weight training. Now you can reduce one or two of those days off and actually have some significant recovery days for whatever, you know, this particular muscle group in question is. <clears throat> ah, that was okay. So anyways, really good ideas there to start thinking about, okay, what is the proximity of my cardio training to my weight training? Can I keep those separate as much as possible? And then also, do I want to have them on the same days or should I consolidate them into one days and make sure that I'm giving some parts of my body a little bit of rest? So just some kind of key points to wrap up here. When you're doing hypertrophy training for sport, we're going to bias most of our hypertrophy, blah, 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 hypertrophy training methods, excuse me, into our compound barbell movements as much as possible in that five to 10 rep range. We might use some isolation uh, movements. We might use some higher rep ranges selectively, but that's where the gross body of our work should be done. We're going to encourage our athlete to move with maximal intent on every rep, as silly as it might seem at times. We want them to really be pushing that force velocity characteristics uh, on the curve to the right as much as possible, meaning either getting stronger or moving 
uh, the same weight faster than they could before. We're going to be trying to reduce some of the volumes in our other areas of fitness skills and tactics to accommodate hypertrophy training. You cannot do what you normally do and then add hypertrophy training on top of it in terms of your sports stuff, right? You have to take down your other areas of fitness. You have to take down your tactics and skill training. If you don't, you're going to run into fatigue problems and you're going to run into preparedness problems. So make some headway, dial those dials down on the soundboard, right? And say, okay, I have to accommodate some training resources so that I can still have hyper productive hypertrophy training and then still make some progress or at least hit some MVs on these other areas that I'm working on within my sport as well, right? We might reduce some of our baseline frequencies by about a half a session to one session per muscle per week. And then we're going to try to avoid having our resistance training and cardiovascular training done in the same session with possible. This is just a kind of common concurrent training recommendation that we make. Sometimes it just happens to work out that way. Shit happens. It's not a huge deal. But when possible, try and put some space in between those. And then we also want to consider maybe using multiple training sessions per day to consolidate some of those training sessions throughout the week and have distinct recovery periods where different parts of our bodies actually get a break so they're not always just taking a beating all the time. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed. We're gonna have even more videos on our RP YouTube channel. I hope you get a chance to check out our upcoming book on the scientific principles of hypertrophy training. Please subscribe. You're gonna see all sorts of goofy stuff. There's the weekly webinar where Mike and I answer all your questions. There's all kinds of like fix your exercise type videos. There's all kinds of cool personal stories. Please subscribe and check it out. I really appreciate you hanging out with me today. And if you have any questions about this video, go ahead and shoot them on the weekly webinar and I'll be happy to answer them or check out our upcoming book. For now, Dr. James is signing out. I hope you all have a great rest of the week and I hope you enjoy the rest of this video series.